I'm Martin Barrios and I'm uh, with Sparrow News. We're speaking today with Mr. Reed Hopper of the Pacific Legal Foundation. He's recently uh, gotten a considerable victory at the Supreme Court uh, in a case uh, that is of great significance for property owners, uh, citizens as well, um, uh, in um, defeating a um, overreach on the part of the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Um, Mr. Uh, Hopper is a is a principal attorney of the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is a nonprofit uh, uh, law firm that uh, seeks to uh, preserve uh, property rights uh, and uh, uh, and issues involving uh, government uh, overreach. Uh, Mr. Hopper, can you give us a little bit of background and and what the case uh, involves? It's uh, I understand it's uh, Hawk and Company uh, uh, versus uh, the uh, Corps of Engineers. Yes, I think it's important to understand that uh, the Clean Water Act authorizes the Army Corps of Engineers and the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate what the, the statute calls navigable waters. Um, however, these agencies have interpreted uh, that term to mean virtually all waters in the United States and much of the land. Uh, once uh, a property is, de is designated as a navigable water or a water of the United States under the Clean Water Act, <clears throat> uh, it becomes subject to complete federal control. Um, the areas cannot be disturbed without a federal permit, and that puts the landowners at the complete mercy of the federal government. In this particular case, uh, we represented the Hawks Company out of Minnesota uh, that owns some peat bogs. The Hawks is in the in the business of uh, producing uh, peat moss for landscaping, and had intended to harvest these peat bogs for that purpose. Uh, however, the Corps uh, of Engineers uh, asserted jurisdiction over the property as a regulated wetland. Uh, under the Clean Water Act. <clears throat> uh, Hawks uh, believe that the uh, Corps uh, uh, was mistaken, that uh, uh, these particular uh, bogs were not subject to regulation under the Clean Water Act and that the Corps was overstepping its authority. And so the Hawks Company uh, appealed uh, the jurisdictional uh, determination within the agency itself to and uh, uh, a reviewing officer looked at that and agreed with Hawks that there was insufficient evidence uh, to conclude that these bogs were so-called navigable waters under the Clean Water Act and subject to federal regulation. So, excuse me, Mr. Hopper, let me see if I can... What, what you're saying is that there, there was an official in the government who could see that this was overreach and yet he was overruled? How yeah, can that happen? How can that happen? Yeah, well, that, that's that's the question. We think that that's a, a due process violation, and and that's why he uh, that's why the the uh, Pierce family, uh, this is a family-owned business, uh, uh, brought uh, the case uh, to uh, uh, to a court uh, to overturn the uh, the court's de determination. Uh, we uh, we got involved in the case at uh, the appellate level once uh, uh, a trial court ruled in favor of the government saying that Hawks could not challenge or contest this uh, jurisdictional determination even though they could demonstrate that the uh, agency was wrong in its determination and even though uh, the jurisdictional determination had been issued over the objection of the reviewing officer. Fortunately, uh, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals <clears throat> um, ruled in, in our favor, um, and uh, this was the first court in 40 years to rule uh, that a landowner could challenge uh, jurisdictional claims of the federal government under the Clean Water Act. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, obviously not happy with that determination because they've uh, had a free ride up until this point, could never be challenged or held accountable for their erroneous claims of jurisdiction. So they, they the Corps, uh, petitioned the Supreme Court to take the case. Now, uh, that was fine by us. We supported that because we wanted uh, to get a precedent that would apply across the nation. 
uh, to protect private property rights and not just limited to the Eighth Circuit ruling, which so, only covers so, a, a few states. So this is really policy that's being driven from above, isn't it? Yeah, I think that there's certainly, um, I think that it certainly reflects an attitude on the part of the administration that uh, uh, regardless of what the law says, um, uh, these agencies are going to push the limits of, of their authority to, uh, in their view, uh, protect the environment. Well, what, what would you say to, for example, critics who would contend that because of this ruling that um, <coughs> certain environments, <coughs> you know, uh, certain habitats are now uh, in, thus endangered by developers because of this decision? Well, this decision uh, certainly would not have such an effect. First of all, uh, we should point out that when, when the case was petitioned to the Supreme Court, um, our side was supported by 29 states and a score of uh, uh, municipality and industry groups and uh, agricultural uh, organizations as well as individuals. On the wow. other side, in support of the government, was nobody. <laughs> uh, so this, this was not a controversial case. Um, the only thing that, that Hawks uh, was asking for is the right to go to court and have their opportunity to present their case and uh, so that the court could decide whether the Corps of Engineers or the EPA had overstepped its authority. So uh, to critics of this, I would say I don't know where they're coming from because everybody should uh, support uh, – um, the notion that uh, under our uh, system of government, the rule of law should prevail. This does not mean, this case does not mean that the, the core or the EPA can't regulate. It just means that they've got to regulate within the law. Right. And when they don't regulate within the law, landowners ought to have their day in court. Now, I understand that you were, you were in the Coast Guard. Were you an officer in the Coast Guard? Yes, in fact, I was a hearing officer enforcing the Clean Water Act. A little bit ironic there. <laughs> well, no. uh, so I, I've seen this from both sides, uh, and it was it was while I was uh, uh, doing that that I, I um, really gained my interest in the law and decided to go to law school. Um, I was troubled, uh, actually, as a hearing officer uh, enforcing the Clean Water Act because it's what's called a strict liability statute. You know, you, you, the uh, the law requires that one be punished, uh, even if one never intended to violate the law, and that to me just seemed unfair. And so I'm glad that I can now fight for individual rights uh, against an overreaching government. What were the sort of um, issues that you um, faced uh, in enforcing the the Clean Water Act when you were an officer? Well, I was in the assigned to the 12th Coast Guard District, which was down in New Orleans, Louisiana. Oh, so yeah. we 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 we, uh, we cover we had responsibility for the entire Gulf Coast and the Mississippi River, and so when when uh, <clears throat> when ships uh, would uh, pump their bilges over uh, oil over into the water, or maybe there would be an accident, uh, maybe an oil rig would blow, or uh, or a ship would run aground and oil would spill or a chemical would spill in the water, then it was, it was my uh, obligation uh, after the local uh, Coast Guard officials investigated the case to assign a penalty uh, for, the, for the unpermitted discharge into the water. That was my, my major responsibility. Well, here in Michigan, uh, um, where, where I live, um, Water is, of course, uh, is a, a daily topic. Um, you know, we have a water crisis in uh, the city of Flint where it was poisoned through government mismanagement. But then in the Great Lakes, you have issues like invasive species that have been tracked to um, ships that uh, come in from the ocean and, and, and don't discharge their bilges beforehand. Um, is that enforcing something like that? Do you think that's appropriate um, use of government power in 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 addressing, um, say, invasive species that are being brought in by ocean-going ships? Well, I definitely think it ought to be regulated. There's no question that the uh, 
harm to the environment is severe and the harm to, to interstate commerce can be severe because uh, uh, these kind of species that uh, um, <clears throat> interfere with uh, uh, navigation can have a significant economic impact. So, yes, I think it's important. I, and I, th I think the Clean Water Act uh, uh, has a role to play in protecting uh, um, uh, waters, but <clears throat> uh, what has happened uh, since the inception of the uh, of the Clean Water Act is that it has been um, interpreted uh, uh, to, in such a way that uh, it has no meaningful limits. Uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, uh, that one thing that motivated the uh, justices to give us a unanimous win in this case uh, was their concern with uh, uh, the agency's uh, overly broad interpretation of the act, and uh, it's just getting worse. Now I, I see you. I guess you might say that you you're batting a thousand uh, with decisions before the the court. Uh, it's it's been. I think it was. I read uh, eight decisions now um, consecutively. Yes, specifically, on foundation has had had eight consecutive wins. Wow. And uh, now, well, I have to, that. I would cer certainly. I would have to attribute it that to the the legal acumen that at the at the Pacific Legal Foundation, but. What does that say about the court? I mean, we've we've got uh, the, there's uh, we've got a court that's split, and to me, it's it's I don't I can imagine that it's what does it suggest to you that there was an unanimous decision in this case in among justices with widely disparate uh, uh, views on other topics. Yeah, good question, and I and I think that the, it suggests two things. Um, one thing is that that uh, um, when when the decision is unanimous, it's not just a win; it's a vindication. And what we've vindicated here was the right of property owners to at least have their day in court to defend themselves against wrongful agency action. Um, the other thing is that. <clears throat> You know, this, this, as I said, was is the first time in since the inception of the Act, 1972, over 40 years, in which uh, a court has has held that uh, property owners uh, should be able to to challenge core and EPA jurisdictional determinations. The fact that it's unanimous um, <clears throat> with such a broad uh, uh, um, and and opposing. Uh, Political views uh, uh, suggest that this this should have been obvious to the lower courts that uh, that a travesty had been uh, uh, perpetrated against landowners all these years, and that uh, and the court should have uh, stepped forward uh, decades ago to protect the landowners from uh, from government overreaching. And it's a shame that we have to go to the highest court in the land. Uh, and as the final bulwark against uh, individual liberty and private property rights. This, and, and the issue of property rights, I mean, what is it, what is it about property rights that you would say, you know, philosophically that is, <coughs> is, is, is of, of importance? I mean, if, for example, I mean, if, if our property is forfeit, aren't other rights equally endangered? Yes, they are. I, I think a lot of people don't quite recognize that virtually all of our our uh, recognized Bill of Rights are, are ultimately uh, based on protecting property rights. Uh, free speech uh, um, is uh, certainly uh, one that is dependent on, on a property right. Uh, what, what, if, what kind of free speech could we have if the government owns the printing press, um, the right to be uh, secure in our homes and even uh, um, our own our own persons uh, is protected by a property right in our abodes and in our in our in our bodies. Um, in in, its, in the in a more general sense, when we talk about property rights, we're not just talking about real estate. We're talking about the right. Uh, to to enjoy the fruit of one's labor, um, that's the ultimate uh, uh, definition, and it and it's very broad. And the and the Constitution uh, 
um, is based on that and specifically protects property rights because it is uh, um, the, uh, the primary uh, right upon which most other um, constitutional rights are based. Where, where do you see things going as far as eminent domain in, here in the United States? Is, is that of concern? <clears throat> yeah, it certainly is a, a, a problem. Of course, you know, we had that Kelo case that came out of the Supreme Court. Oh, which one was that? Uh, that yeah. That's the case out of Connecticut where the Supreme Court said that it was okay for the government to exercise eminent domain, even if it wasn't for a public use as long as it's for a public purpose, and one of those purposes may be to increase the tax base. So um, several years ago in that Kelo case, the Supreme Court essentially authorized governments to seize homes or private property uh, and give it to another private uh, uh, party right. uh, so that they could uh, capitalize on it and increase the local uh, uh, power and, and tax base. Uh, that, that, that has been... Uh, roundly criticized uh, since it was issued. I don't. I don't think it's going to be reversed anytime soon. But um, several states have responded, and they've passed laws that are stricter and and impose uh, um, uh, more protections for the private uh, landowners than the, uh, uh, the than the federal constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court in that case. As, as, as things stand now, do you think the states really are sort of becoming, if you will, you know, guarantors where of, 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 of certain rights, uh, even apart from the federal government? <clears throat> well, the states have always had that role to, to be a check on, on overreaching of, of, of an overreaching central government. Uh, but that's being eroded uh, by, uh, by an expanding uh, executive power through the regulatory state. And, and the Clean Water Act uh, that was at issue in this Hawks case we're now talking about is a perfect example. Um, back in 2001, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled in a case called Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County uh, that under the Clean Water Act, the Corps and EPA could not regulate it, cannot regulate so-called isolated water bodies. Uh, these are those that have no hydrological connection with the downstream navigable water uh, because it would impinge on the uh, power and the rights of the states. And if you go back and if you look at the Clean Water Act itself in the opening uh, provision, it says that uh, the federal government will regulate, quote, navigable waters, uh, but recognizes that it's the state, expressly says this, that Congress ex recognizes that it's the primary right and responsibility of states to, uh, to control local land and water use and to protect such against pollution. So, um, the states are being, uh, uh, they're losing their, uh, their, their, uh, their sovereign powers by, again, the overreaching government. That's one of the, that's one of the significant aspects of this Hawks decision. Uh, not only uh, has, the, has the decision uh, provided uh, an avenue for private um, landowners to sue the government uh, uh, when uh, they go too far, but... Uh, even states and local um, uh, governments can do the same under this same precedent. Do you have any take on, for example, the, the issue of um, uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing that's used by uh, gas for gas extraction and petroleum extraction and the potential um, <clears throat> contamination of, um, you know, substrate by... Um, the water that's used uh, and, and chemicals used to to, um, to um, unleash uh, the, the ga gas and and, and other um, petroleum products from the ground is that well you know there are a number of questions like this uh, 
you know, uh, fracking is one, uh, global warming is another, uh, the uh, uh, genetically modified uh, um, <clears throat> organisms and the like. We, we recognize that we're not scientists. Uh, Pacific Legal Foundation, we're attorneys. Uh, are, are, we're uh, involved in, uh, in litigating uh, so as to protect uh, individuals and uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, local governments from uh, overreaching federal government and and sometimes overreaching state governments. But in any event, we we don't have a position uh, on on that issue of fracking like we don't on the others. We just want to make sure that as we respond to these types of concerns, um, that uh, it's done in a way that. Uh, that complies with the law, whether it be statutory or constitutional law, and uh, that that's the main thrust of and and the mission of Pacific Legal Foundation. Now, I, I'm going to imagine you're not going to sit on your laurels, as as it were. And if I might make it a, a just, uh, uh, what else do you have in the hopper, Mr. Hopper, uh, as far as uh, legal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> other uh, cases? Well, we, uh, you, you may uh, be aware that, uh, um, that we are now facing uh, a constitutional uh, challenge. Some would call it a constitutional crisis uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, last year the Corps of Engineers and the Environmental Protection Agency issued a new rule redefining the scope of the Clean Water Act um, so broadly that it covers virtually all waters and much of the land of the United States and and literally flies in the face of Supreme Court court precedent and uh, and a plain reading of the Clean Water Act itself. Now we have challenged that rule along with 30 states. What's that rule? Other, what is that rule? 70 other uh, parties. And that's called the, uh, 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 some call it the Waters of the United States oh. Rule, or the WOTUS Rule uh, for short. But that's a new regulation that uh, um, is, is, is the poster uh, uh, child for uh, overreaching government because it is so uh, blatantly, uh, it goes so blatantly beyond uh, statutory and, and, and even constitutional limits. Uh, fortunately, uh, that uh, that rule has been stayed by the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and we're now uh, in the midst of uh, of beginning to brief uh, the uh, and make our arguments uh, to get the the rule overturned in that court. Also, there were many uh, challenges brought uh, in district courts over ten ten different district courts. And we, we've been involved in those as well. So that's a, kind of the first step is to make sure uh, that we don't allow the government uh, to exacerbate an already uh, disastrous problem under the Clean Water Act by expanding it even further than, uh, than it has been. Secondly, uh, we, uh, we will, will no doubt be looking for cases where we can apply uh, uh, this Hawks decision where there has been uh, overreaching by the government and we are clear that we can challenge uh, um, a specific application of the Clean Water Act to a specific parcel of land uh, and, uh, and demonstrate that, uh, that the decision that we want today uh, has meaning for the, for the average guy in the, in the field. Uh, the, the decision that was handed down literally covers millions of landowners nationwide. The Corps of Engineers issues jurisdictional determinations in the tens of thousands every year. And now the, uh, <clears throat> these landowners have a right to go to court, and we'll be looking for cases to, to reinforce this precedent. Well, you've certainly given um, us, um, our, me and uh, the, uh, our, re our readers and um, listeners uh, much to think about. Um, so I want to thank you for giving uh, us some of your time. Absolutely. Again, we've been speaking to uh, Attorney uh, Reed Hopper of the Pacific Legal Foundation. It's a non-profit uh, um, 
a law firm uh, headquartered in California that uh, seeks to uh, beat back government uh, overreach. Um, my name is Martin Barrios and I'm the editor of Sparrow News. Thanks very much.